Hi, I'm Leviya. I'm a criminology graduate with a first class degree and I'm also a true crime enthusiast. So today I'm going to be reviewing Night Stalker, A Hunt for a Serial Killer, which is a four part docuseries on the crimes of Richard Ramirez, which was released earlier this year on Netflix. So this isn't going to be me just going through the case and its proceedings in full. What I'm going to be doing is just giving you a brief overview of the case and then I'll be going through the pros and cons of the documentary and then I'm going to talk about what we can learn from the documentary. Again, I know that there are quite a few people on YouTube who do fully talk you through various true crime cases and the proceedings, which I think are great and I think they're really valuable, but that just isn't what I'm going to be doing here today. So I hope you enjoy. So Richard Ramirez was a 24 year old man who essentially went on a killing spree between June 1984 and August 1985. He murdered at least 13 people, but in 2009 it was discovered through DNA that he'd previously murdered a nine-year-old girl. But this documentary only covers the 13 murders which were official at this time. So he murdered at least 13 people, with five other people surviving his attacks. His victims included men and women of all ages. He sexually assaulted some of the women, he also abducted and sexually assaulted several children as well. And often in his victims' homes, he would leave marks in the form of pentagrams, either on the victims' bodies themselves or on the walls. Ramirez was eventually identified in 1985 and was arrested after he had tried to flee through a neighbourhood and was actually caught and severely beaten by the residents until the police arrived. Ultimately, Ramirez was convicted of 13 counts of murder, five counts of attempted murder, 11 counts of sexual assault and 14 counts of burglary. The child assault cases were actually dismissed in order to save the children from further trauma. Ramirez was given the death penalty, although he eventually died in prison in 2013 from complications from B-cell lymphoma after being on death row for 23 years. So let's get into the pros of this documentary. The first one is that I really enjoyed the centralisation of the two lead detectives from this case. Gil Carrillo, who was actually the one who first posited the idea that the child sexual assaults and the homicides were all linked. This was a theory that was initially just brushed off, but actually turned out to be correct. And Frank Salerno, who was actually responsible for solving the Hillside Strangler case. Both of these detectives seem very likeable and very competent, which isn't always the case I find in these serial killer documentaries. The director of this documentary said that he intended for the focus to be on Gil Carrillo and to shine a spotlight on him and to show him as a hero, which definitely does come through. And there's even a bit where a six year old girl who had been one of Richard Ramirez's victims says that she likes Mr Carrillo because he reminds her of her teddy bear. So I do really like that the audience gets a real sense of who these detectives are and their process and their passions and the sacrifices that they made during this case, especially with regard to their families. And so I do feel like there's definitely a hero arc for these two in this documentary, which is definitely deserved. So my second point is that I found this series incredibly engaging from the very beginning, and it really does maintain your interest the whole way through. I often find that if I look at a docuseries and it's stretched over several episodes, I sort of think, well, how long are you gonna take to tell this story? You know, how are you gonna pad this out? But again, this docuseries is told from the eyes of the two detectives, which I find is a lot more engaging and informative than it is if it's just a voiceover or if it's told through news reports, things like that. However, what I will say is that this series definitely does play like a drama. You know, there's so much tension created and it starts from the very first episode when people who have encountered him in the past are describing him. And he has this horrible big grin. And he's missing all these teeth. He just stared at me like a killer clown. And it just creates this air of mystery around him as if he's some sort of mythical monster. And also we're left with cliffhangers on every episode. You know, even the first episode ends with Gil Carrillo saying, We got us a serial killer. What really adds to the drama and the tension also is how often the police keep just missing him. You know, there's an instance where, through searching a car that the suspect had previously stolen, they found out that the suspect would be soon returning to a particular dentist's office in Chinatown due to pain from an impacted tooth. But the LAPD decided, instead of just wasting police bodies and keeping these officers in the office waiting for days and days and days until he turns up, 
let's take those men out and put in a panic button so that if the suspect does come in, they can press the panic button and the police will come. But it turns out that when the suspect did come in and it was time to use the button, that it didn't work. You know, they were pressing it and pressing it, but the police never came because it was faulty or it wasn't wired properly. The button just didn't work. So the police had just missed him. So you really are kept on the edge of your seat. And what makes it even worse is that we don't even see Ramirez up until the very last episode when he's identified chronologically. There's bits and pieces of his interviews used throughout the episodes as voiceovers, but it all just adds to the tension and the mystery. And even if you're familiar with the case and you know who the killer is, it sort of makes you think, I, I wonder who it is, when's he gonna get caught? You know, even the way that they describe Ramirez eventually getting caught and arrested is incredibly dramatic and climactic because, you know, there's a car chase and then he's chased through a neighbourhood and he's caught and he's beaten. And there's even video footage of him in the police car and he's got his head wrapped up because of how much he's been beaten. And it's incredibly dramatic and cinematic, which definitely was the intention when this footage was used. And being captured by the people, it was just, uh, and, and that kind of incredible archival news footage of that and, and the photographs thereof, it was just, it was a gift from the cinema gods to, to, to in, in terms of storytelling, you know. Another thing which I really like, which again adds to the drama, is that they do actually draw attention to the problems that the news media can cause. For instance, there's a time when a news reporter, Laurel Erickson, essentially threatens to release a key piece of information, which is a shoe print, which they find at all of the crime scenes, a unique Avia shoe print. And she essentially says, I'm going to report on this or you can give me something else to report on, you can give me an interview, which the police do, and they manage to get away with that one. It becomes this crazy cat and mouse where the public is terrified, the media wants to put out information, the cops only want a certain amount of information. But then the mayor of San Francisco at the time, during a press conference, ends up releasing all of this information, which only the killer would know. You know, the shoe print, the car that he was using, the firearms evidence, all of which would obviously just make the killer change their MO, which, for example, the shoes, they were never recovered. So I did really enjoy how engaging it was, even though it was very clearly through the use of dramatic devices like that, which I don't find a use very often in documentaries like this, but I did very much enjoy it. Okay, so thirdly, what I liked about this documentary is that it acknowledges the serial killer naming process, which is an incredibly odd process in the news media, which isn't talked about very often. You know, in this case, it was kind of a race to find out what this serial killer's moniker would be and what would stick. You know, by various news outlets, he was given nicknames like the walking killer or the valley intruder. But in this case, it was the night stalker that stuck. And it does kind of make you question, OK, why? Why was that such a priority for the news media, especially since it isn't really common practice now? So it kind of does make you question that in your head, which I really like. OK, so the fourth thing that I liked is that this documentary lightly addresses what we often find with serial killers, and definitely in the case of Richard Ramirez, which is their obsession with the sort of infamy and the glamour associated with serial killings. You know, in this case, there was an instance where a victim reported that he had said to her, I am the Night Stalker, which shows that he was following his own story in the news and that he liked the nickname and that he kind of liked this celebrity that he was becoming. In the case of Richard Ramirez also, he sort of had a fascination with the Hillside Strangler case. You know, he was very respectful towards Detective Salerno because of his association with that case. And also when he was then taken to prison and put in a cell, Detective Salerno told him, you know, we're going to put you in a special cell. Kenneth Bianchi, the hillside strangler, was kept in the cell and Ramirez seemed to be really happy with that. And it's just, I like how it does address the fact that a lot of these serial killers do have a kind of skewed view of what celebrity is and what it is to be an icon. You know, to put these murderers on icon stasis is kind of odd and I do like that this documentary addresses that. It's only lightly, but it does draw attention to it. My fifth point is that I really like that this documentary doesn't force you to feel sympathy for Richard Ramirez. You know, it doesn't really force your perspective, which I find that a lot of serial killer documentaries often do. You know, for example, in the case of Ted Bundy, 
and a lot of documentaries about Ted Bundy were kind of given the perspective that he just made a mistake, he went down the wrong path. You know, they often use the footage in court of the judge saying, I would have loved to have practiced with you, but you went the wrong way, partner. And you, you know, you kind of told, oh, he could have been a lawyer. He was so intelligent and he was so charming, which no, no. But this documentary doesn't really do that. You know, it doesn't really present him as this figure that we should feel any sympathy or empathy for. You know, we don't really even hear from him. Like I said earlier, there's bits from his interviews which are used as voiceovers, but it's not enough to where the documentary could be shifted to be from his perspective. This documentary though does kind of acknowledge that there was a view at the time of him as some sort of sex symbol and you know a lot of women found him very alluring which does have to be acknowledged when we talk about Ramirez and I do think it's different than him being presented as someone that we should feel sorry for so I do like that that really isn't an element in this documentary. And my last pro is that this documentary has a great soundtrack which sounds odd to say but it really does and it looks great aesthetically you know they use lots of cool shots of LA at the time and they use loads of cool graphics and it very much makes you feel like you are in the 80s and this documentary definitely doesn't look like your typical documentary you know if you saw the title card while you were scrolling through Netflix you probably wouldn't think that this was a documentary about a serial killer you know there's the black background and the purple writing and it very much does play into the sort of dramatic rock and roll vibe of the times, i.e. the 80s, and indeed who the killer turned out to be, because, you know, he looks like a sort of 80s rock star. So I do like that it sort of places you in that time in history. Okay, so now let's move on to the cons. Firstly, is that there really is a lack of trigger warning about what they're going to show you in the documentary. You know, they do show you all of the graphic photos of crime scenes and the victims' bodies and it's exacerbated by, you know, they add in sounds of gunshots throughout and CGI blood splatters, which can be very triggering for a lot of people. You know, there's a lot of people online saying, I didn't mind it, it was alright, but I just wish I would have been warned. And there's also a lot of people saying I couldn't get through it because it was just too much, which I do definitely understand. You know, I'm not overly squeamish about that kind of thing and I don't get overly emotional watching things like that but even I was shocked I didn't know that they were going to show photos like that. I also think there's some issues there surrounding respect to the victims and their families. You know they put a black mark over the victims eyes but I just think for me that's not really good enough. I just wish it was more obvious that there'd been more consideration with regards to respecting the victims and also respecting the audience enough to give them a proper warning. Secondly, due to the fact that Ramirez is only seen in the last episode and talked about, we don't really hear much about his life, you know, particularly his previous trauma, you know, for example his head injuries of which he'd had multiple as a child, his abuse that he suffered at the hands of his father, the fact that he had witnessed his uncle shooting his wife, and the fact that his cousin had shown him numerous pictures of him brutally raping and murdering women. Ramirez had also done a significant amount of drugs from being very young and all of these things happened in his formative years which do have to be talked about when we're discussing serial killers. Factors such as brain chemistry, family conflict, abuse, violence being observed and therefore learnt and normalised, all of these things can contribute to a person becoming aggressive and violent and whether these things are the sole cause of a person becoming a killer or they're simply aggravating factors, they do contribute in some way and they can offer some sort of explanation as to why someone becomes a killer. There was a three year long study conducted by the FBI in which captive serial killers were interviewed and a lot of them reported having head injuries in childhood, which Richard Ramirez had had. 42% of them reported being physically abused in some way as children, which Richard Ramirez had experienced, and 73% of them reported being involved in sexually stressful events. I would say that being shown pictures and videos of women being raped and murdered definitely counts as a sexually stressful event. The most that they say on this subject in the documentary is that everything that could possibly poison a child poisoned this child 
which doesn't really cut it for me. I just wish it would have been delved into a bit more because then all we're left with is the question of, well, why did he do it then? Why did he want to murder all those people? Why did he sexually assault all of those children? I just would have liked it if they went into the psychology of that a little bit more. So next is the fact that this documentary didn't really go into the psychology of Richard Ramirez's MO. You know, the fact that he didn't really have a specific type of victim. And also the reasons why he left some of his victims. You know, there's an instance where the first official murder in 1984 was a woman named Dale Okazaki. But before murdering her, Ramirez had encountered her roommate outside, Maria Hernandez, and he went to shoot her, but she put her hands up like this, and the bullet deflected off of her keys, which... He then proceeded to murder her roommate, and when he was coming out again, he encountered Maria Hernandez again and went to shoot her, and she said, you've already shot me once, do you really have to shoot me again? And it's said that he just put his gun down, looked her in the eyes, and then walked away. So they do say in the documentary that Ramirez wanted to see the fear in his victim's eyes. And so I can only assume that part of the reason why some victims he left, such as in the case of Maria Hernandez, was that she didn't seem scared enough. Because this isn't really discussed, we therefore aren't left with any sort of message, where I think that from every serial killer case, from every true crime case, there is something to be learned. So my last point is that this documentary definitely had a very clear angle of sort of acknowledging the view of Richard Ramirez as some sort of icon. You know, throughout they use incredibly iconic pictures of Richard Ramirez, including, you know, the picture of him in court with a pentagram on his hand. Even if you're not familiar with this case, you've probably seen that picture, you know, any time we talk about Satan worship, we see that picture. Any time we talk about cults, we see that picture. And also the use of his mugshot, they use a particular mugshot of one of his previous crimes, you know, on his criminal record, there was theft, grand theft auto, things like that. And his mugshot could easily be one of those iconic rock star mugshots, you know, like David Bowie or something like that. The director of this documentary did say that his aim was to honour the people impacted by these crimes and not glamorise the killer, although I'm not too sure how successful that was. Like I said earlier, we only hear his voice in the first three episodes and then in the final episode we finally see him and from the get-go we're presented this view of him as some sort of bad boy and this sort of sex symbol. You know, even one of the detectives says, I've never encountered any murderer with as much sex appeal as Richard Ramirez. And, you know, they show all the videos of him waving to the girls in the courtroom and things like that. However, this documentary also does address how strange that is. It does address the strangeness of how many women would wait outside the courtroom and how many women would go into court to see him and how many women would send him letters and naked pictures, which they show you as well. You know, there's even, there's a bit where a Los Angeles resident who had previously encountered him, she's talking about these women and she says, I thought they were some of the dumbest bitches ever, which is hilarious. And it is very much like, exactly, that's what we're all thinking. So I do like that it addresses how strange it is, but nonetheless, they do show him as this sort of sexy, rock star, mysterious guy. So it does give you some perspective, but there is a very, very clear angle from the beginning. Okay, so now let's talk about the things we can learn from this documentary. The first thing is that it is good to try new things when we're making documentaries. You know, this documentary doesn't look like most other serial killer documentaries, but I think that's a great thing. The way that this documentary is filmed and the sort of footage that they use, it does add to the dramatic feel of it and it is entertaining, which can be uncomfortable to say, about a serial killer documentary, but this is Netflix and it's as much to entertain as it is to inform. Next is that it's very important to try to understand the psychology behind the serial killer. You know, the truth is that social, biological and psychological factors are what make all of us react to certain things the way that we do. And so discussing these factors in specific cases such as this one is very, very valuable. Another thing we can learn is that with a documentary, it is good to not always have the serial killer be at the centre to avoid the possibility of venerating them. 
But on the other hand, having the serial killer be off centre, like in this case with Richard Ramirez, it can just create more mystery and therefore help to sort of glamorise and glorify the killer. And the last thing is that perspective is very important. And this is just one version of a very complicated story. And it's pretty much impossible with a documentary to create complete objectivity because a documentary is a form of narrativizing events. It's been said that perspective unseats objectivity. And whilst true crime documentaries are based on true fact, what's nearly impossible for documentary makers to achieve is complete neutrality. There does have to be a focus, and in the case of this documentary, the focus is on the two detectives. And what's key is being respectful to the victims and their families and to the story itself, whilst also being engaging and entertaining and informative. So there's my review of Night Stalker, A Hunt for a Serial Killer. Any sources I've used will be linked and I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs> right. Valuable to try to understand these factors. Oh, that was so stupid. Blah.